This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is brought to you by Rackspace. Did you know that Rackspace can help guide your migration to Amazon Web Services? Rackspace support for AWS offers tooling and automation for account management, security, and best practices. Learn more at rackspace.com slash your cloud. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, May 11th, 2017, welcome to This Is Only A Test, the official podcast of Tested. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? Great. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to people listening outside, Sean. Special guest, Sean Charlesworth. Now you may talk. How are you doing, Sean? Good. We have Sean Charlesworth, Tested's very own, in the house, guesting, taking um, Kishore's seat this week. Kishore, I think, is in New York on a work trip, as he frequently does. He uh, left behind Antarctica, though, in his in his stead. Oh, did he? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Where's that ice shelf? Just so we don't oh, forget. No. Never forget. Ne- never forget. The ice shelf falling off. And I bet he's listening to the podcast right now, <laughs> chiming in. We should leave some blank spots in the podcast where he could fill in yeah. and kind of mad lib his own reactions. <laughs> uh, and then maybe he can create a commentary for this episode. Of course, we have Jeremy with us today. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm well. Thanks for asking, Norm. We just came back from a delicious lunch, getting some Cubanos. Quite at a good. place uh, in the Mission in San Francisco, we're, uh, we're they're quite good. I'm a big fan of that sandwich. I'm now a fan. I, th- I think I can extend my comfort radius to the two block um, <laughs> range. To <Yeah. laughs> be gotta... walking, walking more than just pizza and and curry, yep. Cubanos, pulled pork, ham, pickles, cheese, minus the pickles. It's pretty good. Yeah, uh, Sean, how have you been? Very good. I just got back from Construct 3D. Yeah, tell us about that. What is Construct 3D? Construct 3D was a digital fabrication conference for educators. Um, and it and it was it seemed uh, as mainly uh, K through twelve, but uh, university level was hosted at Duke uh, University, which has a really nice fab lab. Uh, they have a wall of Ultimakers that uh, have cameras on them. And you can, anybody can print from their dorm room. Whoa. <laughs> so you, you, you find a, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you find an open printer if you put it in the queue, but yeah. you, can, you can send the print from your room, you can monitor it, and then they just uh, come take it off. The, they have people staffing it. Yes. What? Uh, people take it off for you? Yeah. And they just, there's just this table of 3D prints. It's like you come in and, oh, here. And that's so your print. It's, that's it's free. amazing. Right. And, and the technicians there must be there. How big is this wall? Like when I'm uh, visualizing. It was probably about uh, four or five. Uh, there must have been at least 30 to 40 Ultimakers 40 on the wall. Yeah. 3D printers on the wall. It People have cool. to manage spools. They have to, I mean, yeah. that's a lot of power consumption. Yeah. They're all connected. Uh, so they all run it. It's all IP based. So mm-hmm. they don't need like, laptops connecting them at all. They is run a, it off of a, a 3D printer OS. Is this a, a, a free service to the student body? Yes. Wow, man. It is really cool. Are there cameras for each? They run mm-hmm. Octopi? A little, little webcam on each one. Yeah. So is that public? Like, could we tap into seeing I don't what? I think so. I think uh, that's a closed system for uh, them. Yeah. On their intranet. Yeah. But uh, it was really cool. Tested, got a lot of love at oh, this awesome. conference. Uh we got a lot of uh, recognition and people watching and educators. We got even a few. There's like we share these in our class, you know, for some things. Whoa, uh, that's, I, I, cool. I, I, that's terrifying. Yeah, so we better watch. No one should watch our videos, um, especially in class. And uh, but Alt- Ultimaker was one of the uh, the kind of founding members to to push this forward and like kind of the steering committee. But it wasn't all about 3D printing. It was like. Uh, all digital fabrication. They had Skylar Tibbetts from uh, the Self Assembly Lab from MIT come and talk. Yes, uh, Orgami Robots. Yep, and Dale Doherty was there all weekend. He did the keynote, uh, founder of Make Media. Uh, it was. 
it was really cool. I frank, frankly, at first I was like, I was like, oh, I don't know. They wanted me to be on a panel, and uh, and I was like, I don't. What can I do for you guys in education? But it, I came to realize I had a lot more to offer than I thought. And after spending eighteen years in a university environment, I was kind of right at home. So oh, it was right. really, it was, it was a lot of fun. And it wasn't for it was for educators, not students. Yes. Even though the place where they housed it was mm-hmm. at a university, this is for people from all over the country mm-hmm. who run. Uh, was it what, what degree of education were they? Were, were they? Was it for uh, it colleges seemed like it or? seemed like it was mostly K through twelve, but I believe okay. that there's uh, some university people there as well because they wanted to check out like Duke's uh, Fab Lab and the setup and all that, and they had like training sessions on software. They had uh, you know like um, just like you know how uh, you know curriculum like what's the best way to get this across the students and and work with them and make it accessible and all that kind of stuff. So what it, is the, cool. Was the idea that Duke is doing this right and they're the template for these other educators to follow? Uh, yeah, they they really did have very nice facilities. That's really cool. And uh, and I think that that's I think that their way of thinking was kind of uh, them and and Ultimaker were working together there to kind of bring this to everybody. Why so. isn't this a business? Why is that the wall of three D printers? You don't need a lot of space. You can it can be front. Like retail space, it, why isn't that a it doesn't need a to be business? There, there's what shapeways. There's places you can send mm. your files. But to local, no, yeah, I mean local. Pick it up. Doesn't Walk need into to the be. store. And pick up a a, a, a yeah. fourteen hour print, so, a three day print, something complex, something big. Yeah, I don't know. It's intriguing. I mean, I'll uh, see you guys there and go go work on it. Radio yeah. Shack couldn't even sell three D printers. <laughs> I, I just think it's too niche. Uh, it's expensive. That's yeah. that's the reason. Because the filament is cheap yeah. to run it as a business. You need to charge way more than I think what people would be willing to pay. Exactly. Unless you were able to uh, really help troubleshoot and guarantee quality. It makes a lot of sense for education, though. Yeah, I can totally see that for that because, like, uh, you know, if you just had a service that was open, you'd have to make sure it was locked down and make sure you had, like, uh, you know, uh, things checking the quality of the files. And, like, it, it's a lot of – I'm amazed <laughs> – frankly, I'm amazed that Shapeways pulled it off as early as they did because right. they've been around for a while. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, they've they've done it excellent, but it's it's a lot so of So just one quick question about this, this Duke room. Yeah. Are the technicians monitoring that first layer? Because that's crucial. <laughs> no, seriously. Because I like, don't. Know. If you send, I would never just send a print to the printer. Yeah. I always watch that first layer. <clears throat> um, make sure there's adhesion. Make or, otherwise your whole print is screwed. Yeah. I don't know if we weren't really seeing it under its like normal operating conditions right. because we they were using the space also as for classes and tours and stuff like that. So I'm assuming that on a day to day basis they have like work study staff or students in there who are just kind of like peeking in on it and you know that kind of thing. And you have a I assume the queue management is itself tricky because mm-hmm. you don't know which printer you're going to get. Maybe you like a certain printer, <laughs> all right? Maybe a certain place in the room yeah. like the lighting that hits it. Like if if there are forty printers, you know if it's a That's four right. like a you know, six by eight uh, grid of printers and you all match the queue up. You can print something and make a big giant logo or something crazy. There's yeah. a lot of cool... I, mean, I just and, like the idea. And the whole thing I think was running off of uh, a system called 3D Printer OS which I had actually seen these guys at a trade show like um, uh, maybe... Oh God, it must have been like three years ago. And it was one of those things where it looked like everything they said that they wanted to do and what they're showing is like, this looks really cool. Was it like a, for managing a printer farm? Um, it, it could be a simple, you couldn't, you can do that. And that is what Duke is doing. Um, but you can also just, um, you know, control your two printers, but it, it, it gives you, it's kind of like octo print on a grand scale. Got it. Yeah. And, um, but they had a real, they had an interface. You can like, you know, load your models and store them on the inter online and, and access them from anywhere and then keep notes on everything and send them to whatever printers and pull up video feeds and, at the time, I messed around with it, and it was like, oh, there's a lot of potential here. But it was like I didn't really need it at the time, and it was also a little clunky. But that, like I said, that was like three years ago. So Interesting. apparently they've come a long way, and they've been working with like actually like uh, customizing certain things uh, for probably p- places like Duke. And it seems like they've been using it very successfully. Uh, I, I suspect we'll probably see them at Maker Faire uh, this upcoming uh, month. Yeah. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Yeah, Maker so, Fair yeah, it was coming fun. up. Also, it was busy. Constru- worth worth going. It's not yeah. open to the public, but uh, thanks for going, Sean, to construct 
three D. Thank they're, you they're, for Ultimaker for having me out. Awesome. Yeah. And there are a bunch of other like three D printing conventions, conferences. I know mm-hmm. Joel Telling, three um, D printer guy who runs YouTube channel. He's telling us about a bunch of fabrication conferences and and um, fairs that go around. Yeah, and a lot. Yeah, a lot of those are more like trade shows. I think this is like the first really big one that was like really about education. It was cool. Mm. Yeah. I can't believe it was almost two weeks ago, but you and I also recently visited Pixar. Yes. Oh, that <laughs> it's was been amazing. a busy month already. You guys are yeah. making me feel like I didn't do anything cool. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing plenty of cool stuff. I'm Jeremy. quite pleased. This is like, you know, usually when I'm on the podcast, you, you guys are talking about all the equipment, and I'm not up on that, but I have lots to talk about today. So. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So yeah. Uh, Pixar, what can we say? We, we didn't <laughs> see anything that we couldn't really uh, talk about. Huh. Uh, nothing nothing too behind the scenes. Couldn't take um, pictures of a lot. Yes. So the public talk space, about their building is gorgeous. They're, of course, based in Emeryville, uh, but it's really like a compound. That yeah. It's like fenced in, beautiful, like ground. The grounds are they very, very campus like. Nice. Yeah. Uh, two main buildings and their giant atrium of their, in their, um, I don't know what they, which, what they call that building, the main building. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, isn't, don't know that's the Steve Jobs like. Hall, isn't it? Steve Jobs, exactly. The Steve Jobs building uh, is just as full with light, with great colors in the brick and, and, um, and it was just fun to hang out there. They have gallery spaces set up mm-hmm. on both sides. They had stuff from Finding Dory. It's stuff from the upcoming Cars film. And that we couldn't take pictures of in their but, gallery, but we yeah. saw maquettes. It was cool to learn about the processes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, because they work on multiple films at a time, a lot of their employees don't even get to see what's happening on the other departments because yeah. they're not working on that film specifically. Not everyone touches everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to send thanks out to Alonzo. Uh, Alonzo uh, Martinez. Martinez, who... Uh, You'll be seeing some stuff from him later on Tested, but yeah. he he's gave he spent like half a day with us. He was delightful, interesting guy. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that was great. Um, and the 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 coolest thing that uh, we did go behind the scenes a little bit into their workspaces. The cool thing is how they set up their workspaces. That that was actually the best. Yeah, part. it wasn't even like the movies they were making, which we love, uh, but these. Animators, sculptors, these, any, uh, everyone works in any department. They have, like, it's not a traditional cubicle environment. They have, Some have offices. Some yeah. do work in cubicles. But for those who have offices, they deck out their offices and the shared work environments to really be up to, like, a Disney Imagineer level quality. You can get a taste of this if you watch extras on their Blu-rays and DVDs. Mm. <clears throat> but I'm sure if you go now, like, you, you, there's always new employees, and they're all encouraged to make it their own. And my God, when you have the creativity level of Pixar employees yeah. making their cubicles into their own. The obsession. It's awesome. The, uh, the, like, the, the, they're staying after hours. It's not just like, oh, we're going to put some yeah. posters up on the wall, or, like, which some people do <laughs> and paint the walls. But some people turn their office into a Mayan temple with trap doors yeah. and with booby traps and lighting and sound and smoke <laughs> and you know within regulations and talk about how they tiki fabricate hut. tiki a tiki a full blown tiki hut raised off the ground, yeah. um, uh, the, a crash airplane fuselage. Uh, with like uh, infinity mirror illusion to make it look like it was a, a large yeah. space. It was amazing. Yeah, uh, I was I was fascinated by this because I was like I had all these questions like, well, like what's the criteria? Like, like do you have to like be here so many years or like you know how does that work? And they're like, no, you can just anybody you know if you want to do it, just go for it. And I'm like, and I actually also made the assumption that they had like. Uh, Cause there was a lot of them, and they were, some of these were elaborate. Like, like guy made like a second floor onto his office. Wow, and, you know. So I made the assumption they oh they got a, a workshop. They must have an amazing workshop, and, yeah. and they're like, no, actually, uh, back in the day when Pixar got started, and they were doing, they kind of pioneered the uh, film or uh, digital to film transfer stuff. They ha- they did have a shop. But now that everything's all digital, they disbanded that. And so they're like, no, we're just doing this at home or, you know, people's garages or some, you know, some people have CNC, some people have lasers. So we'll like, you know, get a hand from here or there. And I'm like, do they have a 20% <laughs> rule there about spending, you know, quality time on personal projects? I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think know. it's an official rule that Google does yeah. or used to. Hmm. Um, but we bumped into some old friends, familiar faces, uh, artists that we've met outside of their Pixar um, works stuff um, at conventions like WonderCon or Comic-Con. <clears throat> uh, Greg Peltz, who uh, we featured some of his um, laser cut uh, bone kits, bone lab kits, uh, skeletal kits. So he was, he's a Pixar, I want to say he's an animator there. 
Um, yeah, I didn't realize that. So it was quite the surprise. Like it was yeah. awesome meeting. I was like, oh my god. Yeah. yeah, and everyone there was you know deep into like RPF and and fabrication. Yeah, so very very cool. Did you go to the gift shop? Uh, we 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 did <laughs> after it closed. Kind of. Oh wait, um, what? I know uh, they let us in to look at stuff. Oh, you can buy anything, but we couldn't buy anything. Uh, but uh, Alonzo, who invited us there, was able to pick up some things. Oh, nice! The yeah. Following days and, and brought them over to to share it with us. Do you happen to know what uh, Hawaiian shirt was for sale at the time? I don't think I, I looked didn't specifically catch that. Because no. you see, like I, the it, most recent one. Yeah, I didn't. Ca- I didn't catch. I what imagine that it would have to be cars. Right. Right. Well, I don't know. It's not out yet, right? So I don't know. Um, but I'd, I'd be curious to see what it was. Were you, are you in the market, Jeremy, for uh, uh, I, no, I've, a Hawaiian I, shirt? I've bought two of their Hawaiian shirts. Uh, okay. The Finding Nemo, which is fantastic because it looks Hawaiian. And I, I am mistakenly, I was into Brave for like a minute. Mistakenly? Yeah, I, and now I, I'm not, I don't love Brave as much. So I, th- that <laughs> one has remained in my closet. So if you're in the market for yeah. a large Brave Hawaiian shirt, let oh, me know. Good to know. Yeah. I, got a, I got a Dinoco shirt that I was pretty excited about. But I got some... Um, some uh, something for Kishore, a surprise for Kishore. Oh, he'll what? Get next week. What, a, what about the other guy here? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> wait, hold on. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, some jerks. Piper merchandise. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? Let's get right into pop culture news. Dun, dun, dun. Why isn't it playing? I don't know. Revolt. So sad. So uh, a bunch of stuff going on. It, it is we are in the heart of May already. Movie week, like the movie movie season, summer movie season has begun. It's not summer, is it? It's oh, well, it's yeah. a summer movie. Se- wow. Season. All right. Uh, you have your superhero movies. Your you have your big blockbuster films. <clears throat> uh, I've been a bunch of movies. We, did we have, can we talk about Guardians of the Galaxy for for a minute? Yes. Yes. We've so, all we've all seen it. This is not a spoiler cast. That's for the other podcast. I would like to hear your impressions. And we, I think we can go without diving too deep. Like, we don't need to go 20 minutes in the Guardians of the Galaxy. I would love to know what you think. And we will talk about spoilers lightly. So maybe for the next five minutes, if mm. you are spoiler averse, jump forward five minutes okay. to yeah. post Guardians of the Galaxy. Maybe we'll talk about Blade Runner after. If you hear us talk about Blade Runner, you're safe. If we're still in Guardians of the Galaxy, not safe. Go now. What did you guys think? Guardians of the Galaxy. Sean. Sean Charlesworth. I was disappointed. <sighs> did you like the first one? I loved the first one. Loved I was, the first I one. I was super excited for it. I loved it. I was super excited for this. Kind of disappointed. Wow. wow. So th- they're very different movies to you then. Can you sum up why? Uh, they basically took all the things that people liked about the first one and then they made it times 10. So it was too much of everything. Wait, wait, wait. You mean a yeah. sequel? You mean too no, no. much? Oh, too, too, much. too much Baby Groot. That's... Too much music videos. Too much uh, cracking jokes. Yes. Too goofy. What? That's too... what yes. this film is all about. That's, that's the writing. I think. You can, Whoa, you so can you, have you cracking both... jokes and funny. The first one was all of that. It, the first one was Groot. The oh. first one was was jokes and funny. The first one was great music. And then they just, uh, the first one was Drax being funny. And they basically took all of that and amplified it by like a bazillion to where it was just so no restraint. Now, on paper, I, like I could it. see how that makes sense, now, right? You take the good stuff and you just <laughs> yeah. maximize it. Uh, what did you, what did you I did, plot wise or what did you not like? Is it, was that your um, big complaint that disappointed you? Because I can't see how the complaint is that I watched a movie where for two and a half hours, I had a smile on my face the entire time. I didn't have a funny, smile on my face the whole time. I I got it got old okay. it got old and boring. Oh. Uh, I I will say good things. I I thought Nebula and Gamora were awesome. They really expanded those characters, and I they were the I think some of the best parts. Uh, what about uh, Yondu? <clears throat> oh, and y- Yondu too. Yeah, yeah. Yondu was. I think expanding Great, that was on the villains yeah. of the and, first film. And not giving anything away or anything, but but they the whole theme of family, what they kept bashing you over the head with over and over and over. It was over like a Fast again. and Furious film. It was like Vin <sighs> Diesel came in as as Groot it's and about said family. And he's his family. My family. <laughs> and I'm Groot family. So I was disappointed and kind of bored, to be honest. I wow. and I was just I love Kurt Russell. He is one of my all time favorite people, and I he was great and everything. But like, <laughs> I don't know. I was disappointed. Wow. I, I Jeremy, thought, I thought I only kind of didn't like it, but now I think I totally agree with you. 
Because I, I, everything you said, I agree with, and so that must mean I hate it. I, I, I here's the problem. I don't hate it, hate it, but I was yeah, you really disappointed. Yeah, okay, fine, me too. Wow. The thing is, really here, dis- here's the problem. Here's the problem with the over the top goofiness, corny jokes every every five seconds. Okay, is that if you don't have a moment to get heart to heart invested with any of these characters, there are plenty of those moments. But they, there were not. There's not enough time between those moments and and the jokes. Like it was always a setup and a gag. It was like slapstick. Primetime comedy. It was, you know, like when the the sis, when the what's the Nebula. sister Nebula? She was saying she's going to go off and kill such and such, and then um, the right hand man, uh, mm-hmm. James she, Gunn's uh, yeah. brother. Yeah. He's like, I did really like him. It's like, oh, I didn't didn't meet, know you were going to go that far. It's like I, you totally see all these gags coming a mm. mile away, yeah. and you, no one ever like really responds to one another. It's always somebody being sincere, and the other person responds with a gag, and that just got to be too much for me. And I and I I didn't find it funny. I, I could see that where the movie's afraid to be uh, sincere, f- uh, afraid to have a, a, a emotional a moments, which yeah. it did. It did have those moments. It's mm-hmm. like I think Patton Oswalt talks about that. You know, when his stand up, you know, there's you have a nice, quiet, tender moment, and then someone's like, "Oh no, it's too, it's it's too quiet," and then you got to heckle or you got to yell something. Exactly. You got to do like a outburst, like, like now, break the tension. I want to say like I I felt myself thinking that, and my. You know, my the side of my brain that's trying to rationalize why they're doing this says that's what comics do, and maybe this is the most comic book like Marvel film for that reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't read comics, but I get the impression that that's maybe their thinking is that this is the Marvel series that can do that, that can really be a comic. It can be a f- can be set outside the the realms of reality. And that it doesn't take itself too seriously. It, yeah. and, and it shouldn't. <clears throat> there was I felt that there's just too many. Like there are tons of awesome funny moments in the first one, but the I felt like a lot of the moments in this were like just out and out jokes. Yeah, and like like the the seven hundred and some odd jumps. Like that just I love that. That, that, was, that was a, a cartoon great gag. Oh, this, it just and it just the kept movie going is on. kind of it has a talking raccoon. Yeah, it has a talking raccoon in the guy with the mohawk that can that can fire, control arrows. It's a, it's a farce. I, I yeah. Um, I just one last thing. I love Drax. I that love Drax. He exactly. made that movie worthwhile for me. Everything he said, I, I laughed out loud. So there's, that wasn't all bad. So um, the thing that, if we're gonna go with downsides, the downside I had with this film was that it did not. It was not as swashbuckly as the first film. Mm-hmm. The first film had a very uh, almost Star Wars like Han Solo, Falcon have a ship. You have the, the chemistry on the ship, and then they would go have these adventures. Uh, here, yes. uh, which is, it's not not necessarily a knock, it's just the direction they went in. It's a little more self-contained. Um, the, the story boils down to they went to a place, they left the place. Uh, Feelings and, happened. Well, okay, and I uh, one other thing that that I will I will complain about. <laughs> it's been six minutes. I know. Uh, so so the first movie is all about them like getting together and fighting, and 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 then they come together at the end and they become the Guardians of the Galaxy. They yep. become the group. So what I was looking really forward to is like the crack squad. Like they they've been together a while now. Like they read each other. Like they can just like read each other's minds and like kind of get it. There's still gonna be the bickering and fighting stuff, but like they are just out and outright just fighting with each other and being babies like right from the get go, and that yeah. kind of ruined that for me. No, yeah. well, the, the opening sequence fight was they, they had some coordination there. Mm. Yeah, but it wasn't it a was, crack squad. It was both I of agree. what you're saying. Though. I yeah. agree. Okay. Uh, the opening sequence, which I know they had a lot to live up to, because that tone of the opening sequence in the first film was yeah. was so different and so funny and so well choreographed. Um, they, I thought they did a fantastic job with the opening sequence for this. You're film. You're talking about with Baby Groot. Yes. It was uh, a it was a funny take because yeah. Yeah, all the money was spent in the background. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. all the stuff all you weren't seeing. Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Th- and it's funny the thing about that. You got to choreograph all that stuff that you barely even see. That's kind of great. Yeah. From from yeah. that perspective. Yeah. And, and then do the filming and composite the animation with the actors reacting to a, a tiny CG character. Um, not a spoiler. I'm sorry we're still talking about this, but from a technology standpoint, this is also yet another Marvel film, mm-hmm. kind of like the third big one in the row now that they've de-aged. That Actors. looks so phenomenal. They, they did it in Ant Man. <laughs> they did it in Civil War with yeah. uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. as young Tony Stark, and they did it in uh, uh, Civil War uh, with uh, Peggy. They actually aged her, not de aged her, but they've done yeah. de aging and they've aged characters variously. Uh, they did it with Kurt Russell in the opener. <laughs> it looked really good. And it looked 
super, super good. But you were I said, was shocked. This was a different technique, though. I think I read that this was pure makeup, 90% makeup is what they're saying. Oh, interesting. Well, it's just like special effects. Do as much practically as you can. And then yeah. they'll augment the CG artists want but that. It, they nailed it. It looked. I I it, was a little like, oh no. All of <laughs> I was the, like, wow. All of the movies you mentioned, I think, nailed it. Like Marvel yeah. is the best at de aging people. Well, Marvel Studios, because yeah. the first time I think we really saw some de aging um, uh, was Patrick Stewart was de aged and, and Ian McKellen was de aged in X Men Three in the opener to that when they walked up to the uh, the young Jean Grey's house, the Phoenix house, and you had hmm. young Ian McKellen, and they looked kind of mushy, yeah. putty-faced a little bit. Like yeah. Jeff Bridges from Tron Legacy? Well, Tron, Ugh. that was different because that, that was, was different. full CG. Yeah. yeah. The, I, I think he did the, the mo- a performance capture for that, but there was nothing about his face mm-hmm. that was That was the face. worst, right? That was, that was <laughs> definitely and, the worst And we one. should give props. The, the real props go to the effects companies who are doing this. I don't know if it was the same one doing each one or mm-hmm. not, um, but they're the ones who are like nail on that totally yeah. so marvel's hiring the right people i mean there's marvel is but do you think it's a practice do you think it's escalating it's going somewhere that we don't want it to go is this more like pushing the boundaries of well we can do this we can do this and it's keeping like do we get to a point where uh old jack sparrow right <laughs> uh, where where johnny depp is old this he still wants to do pirates films disney still wants him to make pirates films and they'll do a prequel and they'll just de-age him the whole movie well, at what I point, know. I mean, does it... It's you, different for makeup. At what point, do you, I mean, you're just going to have CG characters. It's going to be like Princess Leia. It's going to be like, you know, live... It's going to th- look like a live action film, but it's all CG. And you but just, Princess <laughs> Leia is different. It, it, it's both the same and different. They, the, what they did with Princess Leia was they found a body double, and the same with Arnold Schwarzenegger mm-hmm. with, um, in Terminator Genesis, a body double, and then they CG'd the face on top. I think it's the same thing for Paul Walker in mm-hmm. uh, Fast yeah. 7. Um, what I'm talking about here is the same actor and changing how they look and replacing with make uh, hey. what they would do with makeup with. <clears throat> is there a with world computers. of difference between those two things? I'll take a Big Trouble in Little China sequel. Well, that'd be all right. <laughs> I don't, you know, I've there. never seen that movie. <laughs> what? There are, there are, Get out. Dude, there are serious, huge, <laughs> glaring holes in my pop culture knowledge. <laughs> You're wearing an Encom shirt. I know. No, I've got some things covered. <laughs> But I have it happens. Huge holes. It, it, I, j- it, I just it, it, watched. It really I just watched my cousin Vinny for the first time. Oh, nice. Yeah. You got It's a movie. Not you know. Okay, let me think about this because you have kids. You have a ten year old. Is Big Trouble in Little China a movie to watch with a ten year old? <laughs> I I think it's a movie. I think it, I was ten when I saw it. So. <laughs> it's a movie because there's some intense creatures and and, and yeah. fighting in that. There's not swearing. It's not a, like crazy sex stuff it's weird for sure yeah a 10 year old might get bored oh, there is a there are a whole sequence in a whorehouse so uh, <laughs> it, it's on netflix this month i think yeah, it, yeah it, it's a film that if you haven't seen it before and i'm really speaking to only one person out there only one person i know is not seen big trouble with china jeremy I, i'm should, dying to talk to you about this now. you should watch <laughs> it in theaters if you're given the chance yeah. oh it's a theater movie yeah. it okay. is absolutely right. a theatrical All experience right. you're going to have it just be immersed in a weird world it's very much like mm-hmm. and timing perfect this weekend is the 20th anniversary of fifth element yeah and i, I would say 20th 1997 i know wow and i would say the same thing that fifth element if if you haven't seen that, it's in theaters. I think they're doing these uh, fathom yeah. event type things. Fourteenth and seventeenth. Yeah. Uh, if you have a theater near you doing this, and you haven't seen it, or you have a kid who hasn't seen it, yeah, it's like Star Wars for the nineties. Uh, Take your kid <laughs> and watch the Fifth Element in theaters. Matrix is Star Star Wars for the nineties. Yes. Just saying. Cultural, but Fifth Element in terms of it being an adventure film. Yeah. A wacky space adventure film. Yeah. You're not going to get all of it. Just like Big Trouble, you're not going to understand it the first time you watch a lot of it, but there's so much to appreciate in terms of the design, the performances, and a yeah, little crazy it. story. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. if, if you like Fifth Element, you'll like, I think you'll like Big Trouble. Okay. I think that's pr- probably accurate. Yeah. yeah. Even though the one's, you know, one's pure sci fi and one's more fantasy yeah. based. I definitely, uh, I definitely put a Big Trouble like alongside like Buckaroo Banzai. Kind of weird, kind of clunky, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of production value also. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, speaking of sci-fi and movies that are coming back, we rebooted Blade Runner, the first trailer. Oh, the trailer's so good. 2049. We talked briefly about this also on Still Untitled. Uh, but uh, it's not spoilers to talk about what we trailer. think about Trailers the trailer. open uh, game. Open yeah. game. All right. Uh, speaking of game, the first shot is a second big, shot. Huge, okay. huge Atari logo. What's yeah. up with it? At first, A, the first thought was like, oh, this is fake. This is a fake trailer. Because <laughs> oh. it, was, it was this giant Atari. And then I was like, wait, is this like a video game? Like Blade Runner, the video game? Yeah. What's up with that? I thought that was a little weird. Oh, I don't know what's going on. But, but it was neat. Like, m- front of the show, Mike Micah tweeted as soon as this trailer came out. That's cool, but this is taking suspension of delete, disbelief a little far. Twenty forty nine, every this a, hoping universe, the things that's going to be around <laughs> is, play, is Atari. Exactly, but I'm like, I'm all in. That's great. That's the future I want to see. Yeah, I, I, I wonder what I want to know what the the backstory of that is. Yeah, I mean, they or, if it's, it's, or if there is one. I mean, maybe I don't it's think a it's a I think it is a throwaway. It's I think it's a throwaway because Atari as a company really doesn't exist anymore. Mm. So it's the easiest nostalgic license to get. I to guess project into like a movie that's been stuck in the eight. The world that that's seems kind like of been stuck it just seems it seemed a little out of place for Blade Runner. I thought. Wait, when does this new movie take place? Twenty forty nine. It's in the title. That's it's called <laughs> Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Come on, Jeremy. <laughs> okay. So it, yeah, it, it looks pretty cool. Um, the, the opening shot, and there's so many things in this trailer that are evocative of uh, scenes from the original Blade Runner, from the top of the police station, the helipads to um, Tyrell Core, yeah. the, the pyramid buildings, the ziggurat buildings. To, uh, but everything is kind of really pulled back very slow. The holograms, the, the kind of purplish, bluish holograms, which are, like, I know purple and blue lighting is very hip right now. Thank you, John Wick. Uh, but it still looks so good. It's all, it's, the cinematographer is Roger Deakins, who did Skyfall and Sicario. Mm. And so, uh, and he and uh, Denny Villeneuve did a Arrival, I believe, as well. So uh, every shot's going to look gorgeous. In terms of plot, do you think they give away too much in nah. this trailer? I felt like I could piece mm. together a story here. I I didn't think I didn't think about it that much. Good. So I I, I was like oh, I, I'm not sure what's gonna go on there. So, it's Ryan yeah. Gosling uh, playing basically a, as a, a character named Agent K. <laughs> it's very very vague, uh, playing a a Blade Runner and hunting down replicants. He may be replicant himself. That's what I think. Maybe they're all <laughs> no, replicants. That better not. You could be say the that case. about anybody in a Blade Runner. I mean, there's a scene at the very end where he's looking at torn pages of a book, yeah. and if there's not an origami, yeah, mm. if, if there's not a or, origami unicorn somewhere there, then that's gonna be, yeah. Uh, Edward James, oh, and James almost, I believe, is gonna be back in the film. Right? That's it has the been reported. Rumor. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want people to stop making Harrison Ford run. <laughs> he he just doesn't run that well anymore. Kind of just shuffles, <laughs> trouble shuffles. Poor guy. Like I mean, he shouldn't have had to run in Force Awakens, and they yeah. made him. Mm. Poor guy. Uh, speaking of uh, other movie news, not trailer news, but a big surprise: uh, studio announced this week that Hellboy is going to yeah. be reboot rated R Hellboy. With the director is not Guillermo del Toro. Hmm. The director is Neil Marshall, who has directed episodes of Games of Th- Game of Thrones, and he did Doomsday. Um, what other action, big action films has he done? Uh, but he uh, he's the, directing it. The Descent. The Descent. Oh, that was a really good film. I love yeah. that film. Uh, creature film. And um, the star is the sheriff from Stranger Things. Yeah. <laughs> but really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I, okay. I can see it. This... Blew me. I was totally taken back because there's been a lot of talk about Hellboy three lately, and and it's just kind of finally put the bed by Guillermo recently, so that maybe this is why he knew it was up. I don't know. Well, I mean that's it's unfortunate because everyone, when you think of Hellboy that in the film, when you think of like, there's comic book fans of Hellboy, yeah. Uh, but just like with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Hellboy on film has its own cult following because how tied it is to Guillermo del Toro's aesthetics, yeah, and his direction. And so for him not to be doing it after he publicly said he wanted to do it and had been fighting to do it with Ron Perlman, with all these st- the stakeholders, um, really s- tells a story of a, a rift between whoever the creative owners are of this, the character and maybe the studio and him. Where his version's not as They not just profitable. couldn't work out his version. Uh, but th- if they're talking about doing a Neil Marshall rated R one with a relatively unknown actor, I don't know. They, like that's not a big money maker either. Deadpool proved that rated R can sell. Guillermo can make a fine rated R film if he, if oh, yeah. he wanted to make he a has, horror he film. He has before. Yeah. So uh, 
as a Hellboy character fan, yeah. I'm I'm happy that this exists, but as a Guillermo fan, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little, little sad. Back. Yeah. So the Ron Perlman um, change is bigger to me. I mean, the people think he's Hellboy. Like, he yeah. is Hellboy. The voice, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. Yeah. And again, going back to makeup and prosthetics and CG, how much of the character will they make CG versus... Uh, what they did with Ron Perlman, which was so, all practical, right, it was a rubber yeah. suit. It was a, it was, and with great makeup. Yeah, be he, interested to see what happens. I don't, I don't think uh, the, the actor of Stranger Things, the sheriff, he has the jaw for. <laughs> he has the voice. He has the gruffness. I don't think he has the jaw for Hellboy. So, yeah, a, a full. I would be disappointed if it was a full CG Hellboy. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, other uh, disappointments, uh, there was a story on Kutaku. Did you hear about this? There's a Zelda escape room. We've talked about it on the show, right? I've Is there only one? I think there's only one that they've designed, and it's coming coming back. Um, it's a big group escape room where you get everyone in a, a giant ballroom. Now, normally, an escape room is maybe 10, 12 people. Mm-hmm. You're saying this is for a lot more people. Yes. Huh. Um, hundreds of people. What? Yeah, in teams. Of wow. course, working together to escape the room. It's called Defenders of the Triforce, and they did it one. Uh, they did one t- ahead of Nintendo Switch to promote yeah. uh, Breath of the Wild. And Kotaku's review is that it's not very good. Well, once you read the description, I kind of agree. Yeah, t- t- each table, teams of six have sixty minutes to solve the game's puzzles, and the puzzles were like stations set around the room that you walked up to, and and so it's just like it, uh, it's almost like. Boiled down to a team building exercise, a corporate team building exercise. Yes, yeah, right. And it's, or, yeah, if be, if I paid forty eight dollars to go to a Zelda escape the room, like I expect to be in a temple, you know, and smashing jars, and uh, that's not at all what this was. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, although some people do like going to escape rooms just for the satisfaction of solving the puzzles, the intellectual challenge of seeing of of of, of the teamwork and. Song puzzles. Sure, but once again, if you're going to a Zelda escape the room, I wouldn't be excited. Here, sit down at this table and here's some paper, and yeah. and you get a hat to put on. Here's a green hat. <laughs> is there is there any reason for the group? I mean, or is it like every table for itself? I think it's every table for itself. Then what's the point? Yeah, that's weird. It's not really an escape room. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's no danger of being locked in a room, except from boredom. Yeah. Um, our friend, uh, friend of the site, Andy Weir, has his new book announced. Again, um, mentioned this very loosely at the end of Stone Title. It's called Artemis, and uh, it's coming out later this year. It's already been optioned by uh, 20th Century Fox, I believe, to be a film. Yeah. Um, I hope he, as his second effort, is not much like um, uh, uh, what's his name, Ernie Ernie Klein's <laughs> second book, uh, which was yeah. basically a, a big rehash of his first book and not as well no, received. No, it was a, it wasn't. Nah. It was a, like the last Starfighter. It, it was okay. His first film. Uh, it, it was still it was a little more. It was derivative. Yeah, we'll call it that. Sure. Uh, and not as well received, but it sounds like Andrew Weir's book is not like The Martian at all. It's still sci- it's hard science based. Mm-hmm. Um, it's speculative fiction where there's no magic. Uh, the magic is that it's just set in the future, in a future where humans have colonized Mars on a town, a city. Uh, I'm sorry, the moon. This is on the moon. Yeah. And the city is called Artemis on the moon, and it's about what it's like for someone to grow up in their 20s on the moon and maybe go on an adventure, go on a heist, and, and a conspiracy could happen. But I'm reading it. I'm going to read this book more for his ability to world build what hard science, using physics and modern technologies, projecting forward what it would be like for a city to work and function on the moon. That's what I, I like. I like it for that world building. Yeah. Um, it. I don't know why, but I read when reading the synopsis, it just gave me this kind of William Gibson vibe, like cause, uh, some of his like near distant future kind of stuff. So I'm kind of, I'm really excited to see what this ends up being. That's not a bad thing at all. Yeah. There's no chance people are going to miss this book. This will this will be a huge hit, no matter if it's good or bad. I hope so. We got to get Andy Weir back on the show at some point. And come in and maybe build some Lego with us, or just yeah. have a fun chat because yeah. he's he's a friend of the site. He's local, and uh, he's we we saw nice him guy. at Silicon Valley Comic Con. Um, yeah, he's remained pretty down to earth. I've never met him, but I've seen your interviews with him, and he seems very chill. Super chill. Um, I I think he's watched a bunch of our videos, and <laughs> that's uh, what he said. Yeah, Artemis is a character in Ready Player One. That is true. The major character. Yes. So there's a crossover. I don't think it's a... It's not the nerd book shared universe. We're, we're not quite at that point. It. Not, not quite there yet. 
Um, this is an interesting uh, story. There's a YouTube video from um, a effects artist. His name is uh, Eugene Romanovsky, and he created a two-minute-long YouTube video to sell his 1996 Suzuki Vitara SUV. I don't know what the car is. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> because it's hilarious. And if you watch <laughs> this video, this YouTube video, it is an effects-laden ad really? for his car. Wow. <laughs> it is like as good as a any car commercial. For his old for car? For his 1996 it, Suzuki. <laughs> the car, it shows, he's showing, you gotta watch this. Jeremy, you gotta click this you link. You gotta click it's it. Not click the link. Show notes. I don't have a link. Um, it, click, oh. the, click the link. And and the, the video is embedded there. What link? It's right there. Oh, this one right there. Oh, oh God. Oh, see, we, we're going backwards. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, you don't want me to play the sound, though. No, no, don't play yeah. the sound. Right. Yeah. If, if you search, you don't need to. Buy my Vitara. It's like three and a half million people have watched it. I, I'm curious what offer he got. I'm thinking. I'm thinking he got a. <laughs> I think he got a lot out. I I think he got a lot more than he was expecting. He takes his car. Off road, not just off so road. It, it starts pretty off, standard. Off it looks, planet. it kind of looks like a regular car commercial at first, and that's impressive enough because he, sh- it's shot beautifully. Yeah. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, it just goes off the rails. And then, <laughs> and next thing, it's, it's it's like driving through Jurassic Park, and uh, it's on the moon. Yeah, it's it's interacting amazing. with astronauts. Yeah, this is really good. <laughs> and then a tell <laughs> and, 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 yeah. So yeah, it's genius. Um, I love this sense of humor. <laughs> I particularly like the Mad Max one. <laughs> this is pretty, pretty good. Yeah, Isn't that pretty good. That's yeah. why we're talking. Yeah, about it's it. really good. Um, I, yeah. I, so he's obviously gonna. He has to follow up and say what he sold it for. Exactly. I hope so. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good. I mean, it's also a good like resume builder. I mean, Absolutely. He's, he's yeah. I get the feeling he doesn't need one. Yeah, I know. Um, and then our phone final p- bit of pop culture news. Uh, we have on the show notes Goonies Lego Dimensions. Sean, what's this about? I just recently found out this. So there's Lego Dimension, which is like, um, oh, geez, I'm going to date myself here. It's like uh, uh, the video game that you get that then you get add on actual figures that actually enhance the game and there's, add just like five of those. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, the, what's the original one? Uh, the, um, yeah, I know what you mean. Oh, geez, I'm, I'm embarrassed. The, yeah. But anyway, so it's one of those where, where the video game is a genius way to sell additional merchandise. But this is really cool. So LEGO Dimensions just uh, – they had announced it a while ago, but I think uh, – I don't know if it's actually out-out or it's, like, coming soon, but there's a Goonies uh, level that they have added. Um, and so they have a little expansion pack that is Sloth, a little Sloth minifig. Um, it's the pirate ship – uh, which is a vehicle in the game, and then nice. the skeleton organ, which <laughs> apparently also becomes a vehicle in the game. So the uh, so you buy the the expansion pack with sloth and that. So so I I am sure I guarantee there are people just going out to buy this just to get the sloth minifigure, and they don't even have the game. Um, uh, and then uh, that unlocks all the other characters, and apparently you can play through an abbreviated uh, version of the movie. That's good within stuff. Within Lego Dimension, sloth minifig is wearing a Superman shirt. Yeah, that's good. Stuff. It's really yeah. good. Uh, I and uh, <laughs> do you get to play? It you get to have uh, Cindy Lauper's song play in the background the entire time. I sure hope so. That would be great. <laughs> and uh, it, what was that song? Good enough. The, the, yeah, yeah. Goonies are good enough. Yeah. And uh, so I, it's either out right now or very very soon. And uh, it makes me want to get the game. Sky- I'm sure my nieces would play it uh, with me. They probably have it. <clears throat> Skylanders. Is Sky- that the one? Thank you. Yeah. I f- yeah, I knew that one. Yeah, did, that's did, the, I think that's like one of the first. Disney yeah. has Disney Infinity. Infinity. Well, had yeah. Infinity. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. And uh, Ami- uh, Nintendo has the Amiibos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, also for, you know, speaking of Lego and Goonies, uh, folks should check out the, on Lego's Ideas, which we talk about a lot, where users submit their own kits for, you know, uh, perusal by Lego. There are some Excellent Goonie Legos on there. Really? Mm. Anyone yeah. close to the the votes needed? To, I haven't for consideration? looked. I haven't looked recently, but I'm sure that there are. There's like there's a really good pirate ship. There's like a really good like the organ room. Um, yeah, and we and that t- that ties in well with our recent Goonies running that we had. I mean, Lego Ideas One is a great repository of just cool designs, even yeah. if you are not going to buy a set. But voting is free, and it's like Kickstarter. But all you got to do is spend. Instead of money, like thirty seconds of your time to vote yeah. for something, and if it becomes a set, then we all benefit. And they, Come on, they just recently uh, 
announce like their selections. I think there's a the Lego Voltron is still under selection uh, for review. I know. There's a Lego Jeep Wrangler that looks really good. Very well done. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So yeah. So Lego Goonies. I hope they, I, I hope they come out with more. All right. Um, maybe the worst kept secret this past week in technology uh, is Amazon has announced its follow up to the Echo. Yes, uh, to the to the Echo Look. <laughs> the Echo Look doesn't exist for <laughs> that's you and so me. two weeks ago. I know the Echo Look, of course, was the version of the Echo with Amazon Alexa that we used to with a camera built in to, to spy to, on you. S- yes, one spy on you and two judge you. It's C3PO <laughs> to <laughs> to judge your looks <laughs> to tell you that is its express purpose. <laughs> yeah, you're it's, to tell, right. it's to fold its arms and say <laughs> that shirt does not work with that yeah. pants, those pair of pants. Right. Alexa, you should buy order chips. Yeah. Wouldn't you like the uh, uh, soy crackers? <laughs> well, this is called the Echo Show, and it is now available for pre-order. It's coming out end of June, so it's actually a long ways off. I wonder if they had to rush the announcement because of all these image leaks, or if this is, I mean, it's rare for a company to announce something now these days, have people pre-order, and then um, sell it, deliver it um, almost two months later, yeah. June 28th. But it's a... It looks like a like a tablet almost with a thicker back, it, um, and it, it has a screen. Uh, they didn't say what resolution, but I believe it's probably a 720 screen, not a 1080 screen, with a display with a camera, and it's uh, omnidirectional, a directional microphones, a microphone array. It actually much, has a larger array than the Echo. It has right. eight mics. Eight mics in there. Wow. You put it, you plug it in, and it taps into uh, the same services that the current one does. Of course. But like we've said, the next step is displaying information. Yeah, this is awesome. I mean, this is crazy, first of all, because I think this is, there's a little bit of genius involved here because if I was designing a product that I wanted to see mass adoption of... You would do this first. I would do a screen first. Yes. And this is the genius of... And people did do the screen first. 3Com had their, uh, their kitchen desktop display. People have put... Amazon tablets, Fire tablets as their kitchen tablets. I've bought full laptop computers and 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 and, uh, yeah. and, and P- PC makers have been trying to sell you a computer for the kitchen forever. Yeah. This is not hardware wise there's nothing new about this. Uh, go figure like the, the computer in our kitchen is the Amazon Echo. Right. And and it's because you you have your hands full and you want to talk to the computer. Now, if a computer maybe had such great voice interaction interface as the Echo did, then maybe that would have been the computer. Well, that was the Trojan horse. The Trojan exactly. horse was when they announced the original Echo. It was an unproven service. You know, there was Siri already out there but and Google Home, but unproven. And what they did was win you over by selling you one, what they called a good Bluetooth speaker, $200, $150 Bluetooth yeah. speaker, ended up being just a mediocre Bluetooth speaker. And two, a voice assistant that didn't promise too much. It didn't promise the world. Tapped into just the things you needed. I to suppose. And it did those things well. If that's the thing, is it, it over delivered? I mean, it, it really over that. If you can over deliver on your promise, you can overcome a lot of the social hiccups of having a talking robot in your living room. Every, but everyone yeah. else was doing voice <clears throat> assistance, and Amazon came along and did it better. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, we we're still waiting for Jibo, which was going to be this. Are you still remember? Waiting? I'm so sorry. Jibo, make me a sandwich. The Jibo robot. With the screen and the eyes and, and the, the voice assistant, that's still not shipped yet. And in that time, Amazon has sh- shipped multiple Echoes, uh, multiple tiny ones, dots. Echo Dots. You get six now, packs. Right. You get six packs of dots. So uh, $230. Yeah, I remember you messaged me earlier this week and wonder is it was it going to be two fifty or two hundred? I said two hundred. You said two fifty. It's right in the middle. Right in the middle. Two thirty. Unless you buy two. Unless you buy two, then it's three hundred and sixty dollars yeah. for two. It's really? only one hundred eighty bucks. It's like seventy bucks off each. If you buy two, have either of you used the the Google Home? I have a, a Google com- Home. Kishore. Guess what? It sucks. Does it? Google Home sucks. How does it? How do you know why? Why? Because, uh, uh, one, it there are two re- two main reasons why I think Google Home sucks. One, uh, they are way too late into its ability to tap and uh, tap into Google's own features. Right. Like if you couldn't change your calendar, all the things you naturally expect to do with Google Home. Yeah. Many of those things you couldn't do, and the Echo <laughs> could do that with its plugins. Two. Google Home was based off of the Home 
on Android, Google Home on Android, right? right? And Google Home on Android, your interaction model is one voice to it, but display to you. And touch to it. And touch to it. And touch and voice. And so to strip Google Home of those things and just make it voice to voice made it feel much more limited. Got it. Echo doesn't have that problem because it came from a place where voice to voice was the only expectation mm -hmm. and now is only getting better because now they're bringing the display, the passive weather, time, calendar, events display. Uh, there are a couple really interesting features that could be the Trojan horse feature. So I think every one of these Amazon products has like a Trojan horse feature, <laughs> right? Like the Echo, Bluetooth speaker, Trojan horse was the voice. Now they have the voice thing is popular and mm -hmm. they can charge a premium for it, $230 mm -hmm. for this thing with the screen. It's Trojan horse features are gonna be voice communication, uh, telephone communication. So one of the features they have on this is it has a camera, has a screen. Yeah. You can make video calls to anyone it, it, they built in an iMessage killer and a Skype killer into their Echo, Ooh, potentially. Right. Now, anyone with yeah. the, the, their Amazon app can now dial in, their messenger can dial into an Echo look, and you can do FaceTime. Oh, not FaceTime, Apple's FaceTime, but you can do the equivalent of that video communication, video chats directly to it. And, <laughs> and, but, go ahead. If you have like an approved, contact list, yeah. like you're on my proof contact or my grandma's on my proof contact list or my you know my parents are you can drop in you can they can dial in their face will just appear on your echo look hmm. and well, you can turn off the video in 10 seconds or they can just drop in and this is the back to the future promise <laughs> i think that's more exciting wait, 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 to me wait, than, wait. than regular video wait calling. wait wait back up what do you mean they can drop in they can say if i'm on your approved list or your family's on your approved list you don't yeah. have to your answer wife, right they can just dial and say if if Kate says, oh, Sean's at home, uh, I want to tell him to talk to him for a second, it's not dial and answer. It's just dial, and her face appears and pops up, and you're you're talking already. And if you're not like, oh, oh. no, I don't have pants on, then you, in the ten, <laughs> within 10 seconds, yeah, you can turn I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. that's for that. And that's they, why they, it's made for the kitchen. They say that that's for limited uses. <laughs> they, they don't see everybody using that okay, okay. But, but that's why I think it's a Trojan horse but feature. There's a 10-second window within which you say... <laughs> No. No pants. No pants. Right, no pants. The no pants. Safe word. Uh, okay. So with the, the video calling, how does that work? Like, so if I want to call grandma or my parents, or, like, do they have to have the corresponding they Amazon app on their phone? They do have to have the corresponding phone? app. Well, no. So, ostensibly, they would have one of these. Right. That's why the network Well, has. they're not. No, but to. if you if you want your yeah. grandparent to have it, you spend 180 bucks, you send it to them, they plug it uh, in, and then suddenly you've they got have a way. instant. They don't have to do anything. So you know? They don't have to get up. So and and is, number you, one best selling like in the holiday season when they discount this for Prime Day or for whatever their yeah. their uh, their their holiday sales their uh, Black Friday sales this is going to be 150 bucks for you know, 175 yeah. bucks on Black Friday these are going to be stocking stuffers for everyone and can you use it to remotely monitor your home then yes that's mm -hmm. the other Trojan horse feature mm -hmm. is that they're going to tie it into surveillance and and home automation systems so you could theoretically. Be in your kitchen and use this to check in on your 3D printer, check in on the front door. Wow. People use it as a baby monitor in the commercial. Okay. Um, I, I'm very, very excited about this. And what's weird is that I wasn't about look. I was the complete opposite of look. And that's because they marketed it as something that goes in my closet where I am getting changed. And I just, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> if you have a walk-in closet, yes. I have no interest in being judged or having an, a webcam in my closet. Uh, but in my kitchen, I, where we use Amazon Echo all the time for every reason you could imagine. Like everyone in my family uses it for different things. To have a display, even my kids were like, "Yes, that's amazing, Mom. Did you hear <laughs> the, the new Echo has a, has a display?" It's such a no brainer. I mean, we, we were talking about this months ago, where I was like, "Okay, maybe they should have a projection, a Pico projector system, or something like to to give you the pass the amount of information you as a human being and your brain can recognize through imagery over audio is just." 10, you know, hundreds fold. Yeah. And so to have that, yeah. And I'm assuming it's it's obviously going to be like a touch screen and stuff like that yes. as well. Yes, touch screen. Because I, I can see that. Uh, so we ha we do have an Echo in the kitchen, and my wife uses it all the time for, for like, you know, you know how many tablespoons in a cup or right. whatever and, timers you know yeah uh but a lot a lot uh, one of the things that she runs into problems with a lot of times is like the mixers running and she'll be like alexa blah 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 alexa yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. sure we do <laughs> yeah. that too. so uh, now you'll be able to see the timer. so yeah you or you could just like boop, boop, boop. yeah you'll be able to see yeah. that. Like, there's a lot of things that you can you have and just the the mere feedback i think one of the best features of home and in siri is that as you dictate 
it transcribes and tells you what you're saying, what it thinks you're saying in real time. One, that it's immediate feedback, shows you the low latency, hmm. and two, allows you to adjust and train your voice and train it better. Right now, you have to use their Alexa app, uh, which is going to be that messaging app, um, to do that, and people don't really use that, mess that, that app right now. So they've added yeah. a new functionality to that. Uh, I don't think that the video calls are going to be as successful as you think that they are, though, for that reason. I mean, until it, it supports Skype, <laughs> which they say you know, don't, they haven't outright deny that it would. right it could potentially do that that would be an improvement but you know th the real problem is that it's not going to support iMessage or FaceTime and so I mean they're not going to be able to get into or Hangouts uh, sure yeah but I mean so they're not going to be able to get on either of the two major main infrastructures of communication but Echo to Echo but Echo to Echo I think is going to be really cool and I do think people will use, use that video to video thing I just think that people like as you get comfortable using devices like this and they understand you well enough for it to become a pleasant experience actually sitting down to google things becomes like i wish i didn't have to do that i wish i could just ask this device to show me pictures of leopards you know and now now but you can they do can that yeah there's a pro and con of that for the vast majority of people that's going to be more convenient mm -hmm. show me pictures of leopards all i need to see is a prototypical but then that's their you're trusting amazon to be your internet exactly you're trusting them to have the best search results yep. to their filters to be the best. I mean, Google, to some extent, when you search Google, that is not the open internet. That is Google's filtered version of the internet with the right. ads around it. Yeah. And, and we've accepted that. Uh, but there's, when you're limiting the input and limiting the output, um, then you are kind of in this narrow-minded version. And at some point, they just want to sell you products too. This yeah. is going to be the gateway to, to get them. Buy, buy some pita chips, buy some soy chips, buy some clothes. Amazon wants this to be your shopping center interface to buy all your groceries um not necessarily a bad thing it's just like this is the reality of and this is what every company wants that's to the be. balance every company has to strike yeah, yeah. That, and that's why i was asking about the google home because one of my frustrations with the echo has just been i felt like the like asking at random like questions like uh what's this or what's that or just information kind of stuff i felt i've often felt the results to be lacking or it's like i'm sorry i can't find an answer for that and it's like ugh. And, and yeah, if, if, yeah. I mean, you have to know its limitations. Yeah. The like, other you ask it to Wikipedia things, and you get pretty interesting results. The other oh, Trojan like horse feature, um, I think, is in this device potentially, and it paves the path for path for at least is streaming video and owning uh, what there means to be their YouTube. They already have Prime Streaming, and while they didn't explicitly say this is a way for you to get Prime Streaming content to, to watch it, they'll have Prime Music, I believe, just like yeah. the, um, mm -hmm. the the current one speaker does. Uh, I think they showed people watching video. Right? So if it taps into Prime Streaming, mm -hmm. then it's not having to use your phone or your TV. I think it does and YouTube while you're as well. cooking, if there's YouTube, if there's Prime Streaming, if yeah. there's Twitch live streaming, I don't this think is Twitch. their- Nor is there Netflix yet. But they own they own Twitch. Yeah, yeah. They want people to watch Twitch. This is going to be an, a if, if it's a device that your family is going to be using, your kids are going to grow up knowing this as a computer terminal yeah. device. You know, having Twitch there is going to make it hugely popular. Yeah, uh, I, I'm excited. Uh, I bought two of them. Wow, <laughs> nice, Sean. You want to get in on one? <laughs> oh, I oh going on because you need you need the the discount. Right. Now I'll check with Kate. Yeah, you got check. <laughs> you didn't get she, one yet. Uh, I really, did, but uh, uh, I might cancel it for a two-pack. She really likes the uh, Echo. I'll I'll pick her brain about that because it actually does sound really cool. We'll talk about it right. amongst ourselves. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, streaming services, uh, there is a rumor that a Amazon Prime Video might finally be coming to Apple TV. Oh, I didn't know it wasn't this on summer. there. Are you kidding me? It's the one big thing that isn't on there. I'm not kidding you. Wow. A yeah, Amazon stuff is not on uh, and has never been on Apple TV. And why do people suppose that is? Because uh, the Amazon, ha they have beef with each other. It's why, <laughs> uh, you know that you can't buy Kindle books on your, in your Kindle app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same reason. Oh, they okay. don't want to pay the fees. <clears throat> they want to they pay the, the, um, the Apple tax. Why not do the same thing they do with Kindle, which is just give the streaming, but still you have to purchase elsewhere. Because the beef goes deep. Oh, beef deep. Beef goes real deep. Mm. Yeah. So Amazon stopped selling Apple TV in store in 2015. That's right. I yeah. forgot about that. Oh, yeah. So uh, the dispute may be over. And uh, so we'll, we'll see if it actually comes. I'd be, I think that would be great. But, you know, if, if, the app, if the, this Echo show becomes massively successful, 
uh, then maybe they won't even need to be on Apple devices because Apple TV isn't from a performance standpoint. Yeah, it's, it's it's okay. Yeah, it's not that great. Yeah. It's, um, what are you saying? Amazon's gonna take over the world? They are kind of everything runs through Amazon. AWS is that's through the back end stuff. Everything runs when Amazon goes down, all your websites go <laughs> down. Yeah, so they, I I think it's they already kind of take over. They're not approaching the a trillion dollar market cap, but no, 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 no. Um, more uh more news. Uh, we uh Amazon. The other thing they're doing with um, oh, it's a big Amazon heavy podcast today. Uh, the other thing they're doing with their Echo or Am- Alexa service is licensing it out and letting devices, other devices, other manufacturers put that service on their hardware, which I think is smart. Yeah. Like yeah, like Echo? Exactly. Yeah. So You can put Echo on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. You just can't make it voice activated. Their terms of service uh, prohibit you from doing anything but button activation. Right. Uh, this device, unless you do a specific partnership. Uh, right. So uh, there is a... Um, and, and other companies are doing the same thing. So uh, Harman Kardon, speaker maker, is doing one with Cortana. And I think uh, Microsoft... I don't know if this is a leak. They had their, I don't know if they talked about this build. Build 2017 is happening today, actually, and we haven't had a chance to follow it. Uh, but the expectation is that Microsoft, with Windows and Windows 10 S and Cortana, wants to somehow, they're probably in the best position to build a Echo Show competitor, a small desktop, kitchen top device with a screen with hmm. their partners that can use Cortana. Unfortunately, Cortana has if you're talking about assistance market share, yeah. very, very little market uh, share. It's built into all the machines. That doesn't matter, though. I don't think people really use it. I mean, it, it does matter to some extent. If it's not something that people are already growing up, there's a first mover advantage. But nobody knew about Echo, you know, when they came out. I mean, I wonder if they, if the isolated device is like the killer app for, for voice. Because of the single feature. Because it's yeah. like, yes, if Echo came out and it was part of every device, and Alexa was part of every device, it would be less popular than be, because people bought it yeah. and gave it that prime real estate. The, the real the kitchen, the countertop real estate is what helped sell it. What I'm more curious about is, is, is Cortana reliable? Does, does she give better responses than the other guys? Yeah. Have you ever used it? Yeah, I get, it's okay. It's not it's that just okay. It's okay. Okay. It's not. It's not on the device that's with me. When I'm at my desktop computer, yeah, I don't want a voice search. The other I'm pro- typing. The other problem is, unless you have a mic array that is developed for voice recognition, mm-hmm. then you're dealing with that bottleneck. You know, you're dealing with muffled recordings that it has to interpret. And it's more difficult for your back end to improve and iterate. Exactly. Um, based on the data it's getting, and it's getting a lot of data with the voice stuff. Uh, last week we talked a little about Surface Laptop and uh, Panos Panay, Microsoft head of uh, their, their VP of all, all these Surface devices, uh, is being a bunch of interviews, and he has said um, there's no Surface Pro 5. So a big question that came out of the event is where is the Surface Pro 5? We loved the Surface Pro 4, but now it's almost it's at least a year and a half old now, and they haven't even bumped up the specs yet. So he said there is no Surface Pro 5 until there is a Surface Pro 5, which means that they're just not ready. It's, I really hope they don't yeah. abandon the Surface design. I, I love what they've done with it, and... Um, and I hope that when they do improve it, even though they've skipped just improving the the, the internal hardware, uh, they actually take it to another level and, and continue on their trajectory. The, their dream, I think, is that one tablet that runs Windows 10, and you can then buy you know buy your keyboard and plug it in. But it is as light as what anyone would expect a tablet to be. Do you think their new laptop will evolve into a tablet form? No, no. Those are two two separate things. Okay. I don't think those are going to converge. Surface Laptop and Surface Pro will, I think, be two separate product lines. Um, final bits of technology news. Uh, oh, what's what's this going on with uh, Pokemon Go? <laughs> Who put this news in? Was it you? Was it Kishore? It was not me. He's not even here. Where is Pokemon Go? You guys are all over the map. <laughs> Niantic. It's Norm. I don't know. Developer of popular augmented reality games like Pokemon Go and Ingress is going to host oh. community events for players in public spaces in partnership with the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which you may hear sponsor, uh, as a uh, supporter of public radio. Huh. Interesting. Okay. I don't think it's big news. Okay. No, this, yeah. is, this is boring. I don't know why someone put it on, on, on our show notes. Thanks, Kishore. Yeah, Kishore. Kinda, <laughs> Kishore. <laughs> Get out of it. Oh. Okay. It was probably me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Whoa. Here's, oh my God. Okay, whoa. You know, we talk about news always happening 
as we're recording the podcast, and it happens maybe especially in VR. Uh-huh. So we're going to jump to the VR minute. Uh, oh, we have one last bit. Okay, Sean, uh, <laughs> Form Labs news, and then we'll go to the VR minute. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, f- yeah, Form Labs. Uh, so we've been using the Form 2 for over a year, and we, we love it. Um, and they just announced the Form Wash and the Form Cure. So uh, for those of you not familiar, the Form 2 is a resin printer. It cures uh, by laser and 3D prints emerge out of the vat. And afterwards, you have to take that print and it's uh, attached to the platform and you have to uh, wash it in alcohol, uh, IPA, uh, IPA alcohol, to get the rest of the resin off. And then after it dries, you put you ideally need to UV cure it. Now the trick is uh, it, the the package does not come with any kind of UV thing, so they have some great how-tos about taking like uh, a box, line it with foil, get a nail salon UV cure for like fingernails, and you put it on top and you cure your prints. That's how I've been doing it. And, and What it happens okay. if you don't cure the print? Um, it, it, you have to let them sit much longer then to both completely dry out from the alcohol, and if you try, the, the print is still actually a little for lack of a better word, mushy. Like it, it looks and feels fine, uh-huh. but if you want to like maybe like sand it, it won't sand very well. Kind of mm-hmm. get my might, might get a little smeary. And uh, they have they've really expanded their um, line of resins. Like they have particularly the tough and the rubber and stuff like that. And if you don't cure those, they just will not be nearly at their full strength or material properties. Okay. Um, so I UV cure everything that I have and you don't really want to put them out in the sun. I would not recommend that. That's kind can be uneven or like way over the top and actually damage the print. Um, so they have now introduced these two add on devices. So the, the wash, which is 500, 499, uh, and these are both scheduled to come out in September. The wash 499, uh, holds a bunch of alcohol and then you take the printer, the, the platform, attach it and it actually lowers it down. Oh, so you don't take your print off. You leave it on the bed. Yeah. Which mm. I'm very curious about. And I'd like to oh, you talk can buy more, more beds. Yeah. So you can like, well, yeah, I think a platform's like 99 bucks or something. Mm. I have never bought, uh, an additional one because I usually just take it up, take the print off, put it in the, hmm. the alcohol and then whatever. So, um, and, and if anybody and who has a form to have, has done this, you, uh, cause you let, need to let the, the print soak for maybe like 10 minutes and then you agitate it. I usually wa- uh, scrub it with a toothbrush and then you have a secondary tank that you do like one final rinse. Uh, so I'll put something in there and then I get sidetracked and three hours later I'm like, oh, I forgot about the print. And for some it's okay, but if you have something that's very delicate, it will make the print warp and I've broken things that way, d- just destroyed them. Um, so the wash, what it will do is it will wash it uh, for a, a designated amount of time. It agitates the alcohol so that you get even better cleaning action and then it will raise the platform up out of the vat. It also comes with uh, 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 equipment to measure uh, whether the alcohol needs to be replaced, which is uh, always a tricky thing because once you've used it so long, it gets saturated, oversaturated with resin, and it's not as effective. So it has equipment to measure that as well um, and tell you when you need to swap it. So that's $499. Uh, the Cure has a uh, is the uh, UV curing oven. It has UV lights in it. It has a turntable to rotate the print. It actually heats the chamber, and you can dial in exactly what material you were using so that it cures it for the right amount of time, and then it turns off. Dialing meaning their their, their material their materials. IDs. Yeah, because they have like up to six different materials now. Now, can uh, you ch- like customize that. still your material preference if you're using third-party resin? I'm going to just... say no. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that is running six ninety nine. Now that, um, I could see that being very valuable for uh, a, a large production house or something like that. Um, that's really expensive, and um, I'll probably be sticking with my little homemade box, yep. which was like 50 bucks. But I will say that does not have the the wavelength of UV that they normally recommend, so I usually have to cure mine a little longer than you normally would, you know. And sometimes I don't cure them quite long enough. So, you know. 700 bucks just to cure your resin. This yeah. company's not afraid of expensive products, though. Huh. Mm. No, I'm seeing this for, like, places that have, like, a whole bunch of printers or they're doing a lot of printing, and it's worth it to them to have, like... Uh, Even curing all the way around. Is, yeah, and in a, in a, in a, you know, dial it and done uh, yeah. solution. It's not... This isn't for everybody. So uh, the washing station's intriguing. 
I think more people would be more likely to get that because uh, that's a bit of a pain. But the thing that I'm very, very curious about is in the early days when we first got the Form 2, I would take the, pr the plate out and there was a few times when I washed it off with alcohol, which I'm assuming you're going to get some alcohol on that platform doing this process. Um, and what I found then is uh, no matter how well I dried it off or whatever, the next maybe one to two prints would not adhere to that platform no matter what. Hmm. Um, because I, it just cleaned it too well or there's some residual alcohol. So I do not clean the platform ever. The only thing that I do is if I switch materials, I'll wipe it down with like lint-free wipes, um, but no alcohol. So I'm, I'm real curious to see how this all works in, in practice. Do you just use a bear platform or do you do glue stick or hairspray or anything? No, like this is actually an aluminum, a bare aluminum platform and it super uh, makes the first few layers of the resin when it cures it with the um, the laser, it yeah. makes it super dense and it just adheres directly cool. to the aluminum. Oh, neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it and as Norman, I can attest, it really sticks on there. Yeah, yeah. totally. So, uh, yeah. One last <laughs> bit of tech news. Uh, we've been talking about HDR for a long time, Netflix HDR. Um, and on mobile devices, the phone I reviewed, the LG G6, now is finally getting Netflix HDR support wow. through the Dolby Vision um, standard. Um, so I will be checking that out. Uh, but I think you have to upgrade your Netflix plan to support 4K HDR mm -hmm. to get that. Yeah. So that's going to be like um, $2 more a month. But yeah. Okay. I'm completely in the dark with this. What wh is this like HDR, like HDR photography? HDR for video. S Intra so yeah, it needs to be it's a certain brightness on your screen. That's interesting. And there are two competing standards, HDR10 and, and Dolby Vision. Uh, and Dolby Vision is seemingly the more popular one these days. Uh, phones will have it, and your TVs have it, of course, but to get it on your TV it, or your phone, and you know, devices need, uh, uh, services need to support it, so Netflix, Hulu need to actually act actively Is that like an on-the-fly adjustment type thing per device, or? It's a different stream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. people, I mean, people who compare it to uh, the other new technologies say it makes a bigger impact than 4K. You know, it's, it's a noticeable difference. That sounds cool. Yeah. I like it. I just upgraded my plan, Netflix plan, to the Ultra HD. Even though I don't have a 4K TV, I want to try the HDR. Um, before we move on to our next segment, I do want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode of This Is Only Tests, and that, again, is Rackspace. Uh, did you know that Rackspace can help guide your migration to Amazon Web Services? With hundreds of innovations each year on the AWS cloud, many companies are seeking assistance from certified experts to meet their business outcomes. Whether you're planning to move or already use Amazon Web Services, Rackspace's famed fanatical support for AWS is the answer for businesses facing these challenges. With more than 770 AWS certifications and counting, they're a premier consulting partner certified in AWS DevOps as well as AWS marketing and commerce. They provide tooling and automation for account management, permissions, security, and best practices so you can control your cloud costs and sleep well at night knowing that Rackspace will monitor your AWS 24-7, 365 days a year. Learn more at rackspace.com slash your cloud. The VR Minute Virtual Reality This Week. Uh, v oh, I was just saying, what? VR yep. news always happens as we are recording what? the podcast. What happened? All right. You want to talk about last week's news? Chet left. Chet, le Chet left while we were recording the podcast. <laughs> He said, that's it. He said, those guys are recording the podcast. <laughs> the VR minutes, it's too long. It's not long enough. I'm I, done. I made it to episode yeah. 10, projections. Chet, Chet, Chet Falsak uh, <laughs> of, of uh, Valve, for the longest time, uh, been a Valve. Uh, he has left. We talked about that last week. Yeah. Um, Oculus dumped Oculus Storage Studios. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That happened last week. Happened last week while we were recording the podcast. They announced Oculus Storage Studio uh, team. They've done, I think, only three short films Henry mm -hmm. um, well the first one was Lost Lost yeah Lost and then Which Henry was a very Iron Giant like uh, they were experimenting with gaze based storytelling that was so, one of the first like DK2 demos where you were looking they would indicate uh, they would progress the story based on where you were, lo yeah. where you were looking but standing uh, not interactive all of them are not interactive 
in a sense that you're not uh, using motion controls with the environment. You're Interacting just, with it. Yeah, you're just, it, it is a passive, uh, you're watching an animation unfold. Yeah. And the characters only respond to you, like Henry responds to you by looking at you. Right. Gives you eye contact. That's true. And so that that's the most interaction you get. Yeah. Uh, Dear Angelica was the most latest effort, and they had built the quill tool to demonstrate that. And it's beautiful. Uh, and it's really sad that they are no longer uh, going to operate. They're no longer even making these these films, these VR films. Yeah, the company line is they want to empower third parties to do the same thing. It was They were going to spend the money they would have otherwise spent on running Oculus Story Studio to help third-party filmmakers experiment in VR film, which is admirable. But you got to imagine that Story Studio would just... Like, what were their metrics for success? What did Oculus, what exactly. did Facebook want to get out of this having spent so much money investing in storytelling experiments. And I'm surprised that they didn't get whatever they wanted out of it. They got an Emmy. They, they were at, they were at, really? they yeah. were at Sundance, <laughs> I think, for all three of these productions, and they got a lot of great press out of it. Great awards, press awards, and they and some brought of the best stuff they that put, come out of VR. They put some the spotlight on VR to the cinematic world, to the world of cinema, in a way that no one else was doing. And I think it was really it did a great service to the whole movement. Do you think that maybe they reached their goal too quickly? I don't know. Or they, maybe they got to a point where maybe they just, other, the baton had to be passed. Maybe they're just reprioritizing, but it was a great thing, and I'm sorry to see it go. Um, I mean, as a business model, it's never going to make sense in the long run. No. People mm-hmm. called it you know, the Pixar VR, and there were a lot of people who worked at Pixar that worked here and, right. and got the ability to be really creative in a new interactive uh, space. Um, the v- making, spending, uh, you know, a million dollars, however much, a lot of money making these 10 minute long experiences. Uh, it was never going to re- have a return like a video game, interactive game, or a movie. You either do never get the distribution. Especially that they were free. Yeah. yeah. They, and they, they had to be free. And in the long run, it you know the expectation should be set that if a production pipeline could be put in place where a company could release episodic VR content, entertainment content, that you should pay for it. This mm. stuff shouldn't all be free at the end. It's great that they're learning right now and that stuff is free for us to consume and I'm happy to, to watch it. But the, uh, the, the companies need to figure out the business models for these things. And right now, it's just the market isn't, it's, it's the whole chicken and egg problem. There aren't enough people using, whether it's Google Daydream or Oculus Rift or HTC Vive, sustain a, uh, a like something the equivalent of the TV business or the film industry. The big problem for me is I don't feel like they've reached their potential yet. As great as Dear Angelica is, and I, and I think it is definitely the best of the three, even though it's a cr- wildly different aesthetic, I just feel like there's a, so much further that it could go because it was still a stationary camera, mm-hmm. and it still is like one scene. Yeah, you know, I, there's so much more that you could do with cinematic storytelling. Maybe they just saw the expense getting too high. Um, and those are not never cheap. Building yeah. the assets, um, a lot of that the animation today making episodic content is building assets to be reused and a lot of that stuff not being all hand animated but being something procedurally generated Mm -hmm. and it's building the engines to do that yeah i don't know sean have you had a chance to watch some of those uh, vr films uh I haven't actually experienced them in VR, mm. but like I, I watched it because I was like, oh, what's this about? So yeah, I did watch them and they look really, really cool. I mean, for something like Henry, the, the question we have to ask again is, did any of these experiences need to be in VR or could they also be, could you also have experienced them with a good pair of headphones and a 360 uh, 2D interface, moving a mouse cursor around? Yeah, I feel like Dear Angelica st- started to experiment further with that. They really started to push that, where things happened all around you. So it really was like you were in the center of a stage rather than being at the edge of it. Mm-hmm. And you had to look in every direction to follow the story. And not only that, but your place in that storytelling world, even though as abstract as it was, you know, it was it ranged from small scale where you saw, as the character felt small, they literally were small, yeah. And you could walk around, and then you, the positional audio where you'd hear them whisper, yeah. And then, as it reached to the emotional climax, and it would f- engulf and surround you, you being present in their storytelling space really mattered. Whereas for Henry, because the space never changed, you're always in Henry's yeah. tree house. Um, it could have, I think, been experienced with a. a, a a camera, um, uh, a 360 yeah. camera. I mean, you lose the eye contact. You do. 
you lose you lose that um, but it didn't change that experience for me that much yeah no you're probably right and it's looking left and right looking left and right and to be to be honest i mean um my i feel like my my kid my my 10 year old who loves vr is a good metric is a good like test case for whether or not vr experiences are compelling or not um and and he really didn't care he really didn't care about henry he's like over it um so the, the non-interactive stuff, something to be said about it not being where the money is. And they never did social storytelling. What, what would it mean for you, me, Will, and Kishore to be in a VR space together and have a story happen around us and for us to have, so, to, yeah. you know, to have the watch together experience? Maybe, maybe now that that company's been disbanded, maybe they'll share that, what they were working on and some of their ideas and other people can run, run with it. That. Yeah, but if they... I mean, if they really want VR to succeed, that's why they made had this company to begin with, this division. Then they should let those ideas and you know go. Well, Quill's out there. Quill is. I mean, you have the tool set is released, and people mm -hmm. can make their own Dear Angelicas yep. uh, if they want to spend the time and have the effort to put into it. Uh, so that's one really like, a great benefit of that. Um, Quill, Medium, uh, that those tool sets are out there. Uh, the news, the VR news that happened as we were recording today, and I'm glad I caught it. So we're going to talk about it next week. Is our friends at Alchemy Labs what have now been acquired by Google? Oh, oh what? Real time reaction, folks. <laughs> wow. Jeremy's mind is blown. What does that oh, mean? he slaps his face. What does to that think mean? Hot takes. Hot takes. Okay, so that's. I mean, he has so many feels. They're not going to become like a daydream exclusive now, right? This is the fear. No. So Alex Schwartz and his team, uh, Allison-based Alchemy Labs, they got seed funding uh, last year. Uh, to grow their VR team, really all in on VR. One of the first, you know, they they came out of um, the uh, the Vive, the Steam VR early days, right? Job yeah. Simulator was one of the first titles for both um, Steam VR and Oculus and PSVR. And now, well, they're crazy talented. I mean, they were sent dev kits and they had Job Simulator up and running in a in a month. Yeah. And they've taken that in those interaction models and the simple idea, and they've released their second full game, which is Rick and Morty's uh, Virtual Rickality, which we're going to be reviewing on this week's projections. And now they announce they are going to be owned by Google. All right, so Google loves both platforms, right? They've brought, um, what's their painting program? Tilt Brush. Tilt Brush. They've brought VR. Tilt Brush, first of all. Google Earth VR, yep. And Google Earth VR, both at both platforms now. So they're agnostic, right? They're, they're, they just want... They're just curious about the platform. I wonder why would they would why would they hire this game company though? That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, what it tells me is that uh, again, the hope is that they're they're going to still be making and experimenting with content, not moving backwards, mm -hmm. not regressing to just daydream style, you know, Gear VR style experiences. Like their expertise is in building interaction models and systems, interaction systems yeah. for for motion controlled VR, and also experimenting with uh, pioneering in uh, mixed reality filming, right? Because they're That's doing true. a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and so I think they're going to continue doing that. What it tells to me said to me is that Google wants to also seriously move into maybe beyond Daydream and maybe into a device that has track, positional track controllers, inside out tracking, something that they're not ready to talk about yet. Don't you assume um, they have already internally? Uh, that's, that's again, that's my assumption. Yeah. And, and who better to get early access to prototype hardware than someone who did that and kind of made, you know, was one of the, one of the teams yeah. that made the Vive popular than Alchemy Labs. They said Job Simulator was the best-selling VR game of all time, like, of all time, of the past year. <laughs> it's so interesting because if you go back and look at the premise of Job Simulator and the game, to me, as someone who loves VR games and loves games like Rec Room, yeah. like it's it's fun, but it's not that fun. But if you give it to a kid, they could spend all day in Job Simulator. Not just a kid, man. A anybody who Anyone new to VR, like hours yeah. in Job Simulator. That's right. It's the perfect gateway game. They captured something so innate in our wanting to interact and demonstrating throwing how, things and, and th throwing yeah throwing things but it comes to throwing things against other things and chopping with virtual knives that's yeah. what people want yeah yeah I mean that they understood that you have to make interfaces big like Duplo Cartoon big yeah. right yep. if it's a Lego it's Duplo mm -hmm. and it's like the buttons are as big as your hand and you mash things yeah they, they understood that it didn't have to look like natural interfaces that we use with our fingers. And they're clever enough to do surprise and delight things. Yeah. You know, and a lot of Easter eggs in their level design, in, in, in their mechanics. It's strange that it's Google that bought them and they didn't just get absorbed into like a valve. Yeah, I mean, I have to believe as, as genius as those guys are that they weighed the pros and cons 
for not just for their wallets, but for their careers in VR, and that they know that this is a good thing for VR. It's. I think it's hard to say no to a company like Google. I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of people who say no. You don't want to work there because mm. that is that is a lot of resources. It, it feels a little bit like Silicon Valley. It's not the Pixar. Alchemy it's like Labs guy. It's like the anti Pixar. Alex Schwartz, you are like a like the uh, uh, what's his name from Silicon Valley? Thomas Middleditch's character <laughs> from Silicon Valley. Yeah. But who's Thomas? What? You watch Silicon Valley the uh, show? Not since season one. Oh come oh, on! I, I, I'm all cut up, Norm. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, they've joined Huli. <laughs> Gavin Belsom has bought him out. Yeah, <laughs> bought out Alchemy. It's the big VR play. <laughs> I just, I, I have, I have to believe they know what they're doing. I wish them the best, yeah. and I, I still am going to be excited for whatever they put out. I just really hope that it's not going to force me to buy an, a VR headset that I'm not interested in. To oh God! It. What, dude? <laughs> you're going to be interested in any VR headset, and if Google comes out with one with motion controllers, you know it's going to be compelling, right? It'll be a crowded field. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, event by that time it's going to be wireless, though. That's my ima- that's what I imagine. Yeah. Um, speaking of um, room scale, which is what um, Chop Simulator is, and in, in, uh, the Rick and Morty game, uh, Oculus had supported room scale as an experimental mode. Uh, 360 was what the most they really supported with two cameras. Room scale with three cameras, uh, with the Rift version uh, 1.15 software. Uh, the three sensor room scale setup is moving from experimental mode to a fully supported mode. Da da. That doesn't mean it's gonna be any better necessarily. It just means they're really they're gonna support it. Well, man, I mean they're they're confident enough to support it. The the bugginess of that three camera mode had a lot of people not being able to use VR at all for mm-hmm. for weeks and if not months. Yeah. And so now that it's all solid, uh, that's gonna, gonna make a lot of people happy. And I wonder how much of that is. Um, with their tutorial system, like they take a lot of pride in how how well their uh, their wizard and setup wizard acclimates you to the VR experience, mm-hmm. and so that's not easy to to build and set up either. Uh, one last bit of VR, Marvel Entertainment. Big 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 words from Marvel. <laughs> they said that they're going to ex- expect some announcements in VR. Yeah. Didn't say what timing, and they think that. It, their fans are going to go crazy. What are the odds that whoever wrote this press release even knows what they're talking about? <laughs> I don't trust this at all. Well, you did see Mark Zuckerberg's photo where he made Spider-Man hands. I didn't. What? Did you not see the Spider-Man hands where Mark, come on, Mark Zuckerberg visited the VR labs, the Oculus labs? His own In VR Seattle. Labs? Yes, he, he yeah, owns yeah. it all. Yes, yeah. he, went, he, he went to check on, yeah, he, yeah. he Tony Stark it, walked into the lab. <laughs> I own all you and you and you. I, I didn't see him do Spidey hands. And he had a photo where he did Spidey hands. Huh. They're experimenting with, um, with, yeah. with gesture controls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope they're right. I just hope they're right. Spidey hands, cloud, uh, Winland style game with yeah. Spidey hands. I mean, eventually. Hey, that would blow my mind. Oh, it'd be great. I would love it. Sw- swinging around. Yeah. There's just been no good movie uh, VR p- cross promotion yet. Uh, I'd love to see it happen because Thwit. eventually they're going to get good at it. Thwit. 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 All right. um, and I think that does it for uh, the VR Minute. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Uh, I have nothing to contribute to VR. I've got to get you a headset. I've just been sitting over here quietly. What's that? Got to get you a headset. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Uh, well, I've actually been testing the Amazon Alexa Skills Kit. I spent the past weekend tinkering, for, and I didn't even know about this new Echo, which is interesting. So I'm, I'm a, this, and that's why I'm twice as excited about it because now I know how to make Alexa skills. But um, yeah, I dove into that skills kit, and I know how to make uh, Alexa skills now. So I made it control the game frame. Really. Which was the obvious thing to do for me. That is, ex- that's really exciting. You used to be able to. I mean, you still can. You can c- control just about anything using if this then that, which is an intermediate service uh-huh. uh, that you can get Alexa to talk to, which then will talk to your thing. But there's a delay, s- ten seconds maybe. So if you do it natively, uh-huh. the events happen like instantaneously as soon as you, <laughs> as soon as you talk. So it's a lot of fun. Like I can, and I can also pass natural language to the game frame. So I can have it play specific folders, specific animations. What? You know, set. So 
how does this work? It's it's a pretty neat, you know, it's uh, it's fun designing for voice too because it's different than graphical user, user mm -hmm. interface. Mm -hmm. It's com they they actually have a they call it um, voice user interface. I think they have it's like a new terminology right. like designing for voice. Right. Um, but anyway, it's you know you you tell it Alexa all the possible things that you wanted to say. Okay. And then it it that's not like a finite list. It then the natural language system in sort of gets the gist, and then it will know how to interpret other phrases that they think adhere to right. one of these phrases. Right. And you in, in, in your phrases you insert little keywords that then apply to actual actions that are sent. Then then there's like you know JSON and um, it, JavaScript that sends the stuff to your server. Is, is this like a line by line coding, or is it like like uh, like um, graphical like uh, they're making it prettier block you know kind yeah. of stuff it's graphical interface kind of stuff uh up until recently it was line by line okay and now it they've made it a little easier where you can type a single sentence in and say that's an example and then another one that's an example um but it's it's still kind of techy but there's really nice tutorials out there for how to do it uh and the, the easiest stuff is just to use like not to use thir third-party devices mm -hmm. just to use amazon echo which is like crazy e easy you can have you uh you can do a trivia skill in about five minutes if you have an Echo and an Amazon account. It's all free. Uh, you just sign up and you 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 know upload all the sample code, and suddenly you can ask your Echo to tell you a um, a piece of trivia about whatever the sample is, like anime or something. That's and cool. it will spit back one of these random lines, and that's trivial to convert to whatever you want. Right. And so it's just it's a lot of fun. And if you publish a skill, you get a free T-shirt. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Waiting for your free T-shirt, Sean. Anything you've been testing? I've been testing a shed. A shed? You built a shed. Right. You yeah. built a shed in your in your backyard. <laughs> no, we we don't even have a backyard. We were lucky enough to get a patio uh, here uh, in California, right. um, and it's not a giant patio. But we've been accruing a lot of junk, so we had like a wood pile, like uh, we had lumber because we were building some stuff, and had, like a car carrier because we don't have a car right now. I had a ladder, or, you know, just stuff piling up and uh, I was laying in bed couldn't sleep and I found out that you could buy flat pack metal sheds on Amazon wow <laughs> okay for like you could get an 8 by 6 flat pack plaque the flat pack metal shed for like 270 bucks prime yeah free hot, shipping hot damn um, so I actually discovered though you could get the same one at Home Depot for 220 so we went and bought this and spent a weekend building an 8 by 6 metal shed and it's it, uh, my grandparents will be proud. They're the exact same old metal sheds that they had for years. I saw a picture of it on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. It's great, and uh, it takes up like one little corner of our patio, and we managed to fit every single thing in it, and then some. And then I even cleared some stuff out of the house. Do you have electricity in there? Nah. <laughs> nah you could maybe. imagine doing that though, right? You could. Yeah, I could could if we wanted yeah. to. Yeah. But that that was fun. That was an experience. But uh, the worst the worst part actually was just leveling the ground to hmm. put it on. That was a big pain in the butt. Concrete or what? How'd you do that? It's no. It was even worse. Uh, it's it's uh, the patio is concrete, but then the border around it is like dirt and mulch, hmm. and it's probably got about like eight inches of old decayed mulch, and you couldn't really put the the yeah. the shed on that. So I had to d dig out all the mulch and then level the the dirt so because there's like a metal wood uh metal frame floor that goes on it but yeah so we did that and um so that was more uh household kind of stuff and then uh uh lowell's bot sent us a pair of printers so yeah. uh, i've got the taz 6 which is the gigantic one uh, it's it's so big i actually did not have a place in my workshop that i could put it um, like literally none of my workbenches were deep enough to accommodate this printer. How big is the bed? Do you know? It's I, I don't know the exact uh, uh, print size, but it's close to like 12 by 12. Wow. Um, and everything on this thing is like just beefy. Yeah. And um, so it's it's in the dining room right now. But uh, then I've been on the road, so I haven't got to actually play with it. But Norm, yeah, I got you the, got the uh, Mini. Yes. So this isn't exactly new. The Lulzbot Mini has been out, I think, since 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much smaller, it's half a quarter of the size of the the bed, six inches by six inches, yeah. as opposed to twelve inches a foot by a foot. But I think vertically you can go a little higher than six inches. Yeah. Uh, on this, um, and it is super. I mean, I, I've 
we've had people tested for us and and, mm-hmm. and written, read a ton about it, but until actually setting it up, it is the most easiest 3D printer I've set up to use. You don't do a lot of 3D printing, but you br- outside here, you yeah. brought in a Groot that looks better than anything I printed on my PrinterBot Plus. It was it runs Kira, so Lulzbot has their version of Kira, mm-hmm. um, and we have Simplify. But and if you want to go into the weeds of everything, Kira is fine. Yeah, for, for absolutely. That stuff. And on their high profile setting, you know, um, point, uh, 100 microns, 0.1 millimeter. It's the prints look so good. So like you know, did the tugboat. Yeah. Did your very t- I did some very tiny X wings. They're very big X wings, um, and then did a the big baby Groot. Um, it moves fast too. Hmm. So like the three things I like about this side print quality is one, it prints fast. The X Y axes go really really fast. Hmm. Two, uh, self leveling. Yeah. So self- was there was there any first time setup? No. Really? It can you can go from taking out of the box, plugging it in, installing software to printing something in. 20 minutes at most and that's mostly just downloading software see with the printer bot the there is a a sensor to, to sense the aluminum so it knows the, yeah. the z height but it doesn't know where the head is in relation to that sensor so you have to calibrate so that. here it sensors on all four corners of the bed which is the uh, pi bed using the head using the head See, that's great and the yeah. head taps down and it does that get this it has a self-cleaning head it scrubs the heats up the head uh-huh. to melt plastic Based on your material, and then scrubs the head against a pad behind the print bed uh-huh. to clear off any gunk you have initially, and then does the leveling. Which is really smart because even something like uh, we we've been testing the Ultimaker Three, which has a self leveling, mm-hmm. and on occasion I will run into the problem where there's a little uh, filament booger on Just the end, the tip, yeah. and that will mess up the the calibration process. So <laughs> that it's neat. It's like this, like really. St- it's almost like a, a really rigid felt strip, and it just kind of scrubs the head on it. It pushes that head like yeah, deep really into neat. the felt pad. Um, it gives you replacement pads, and that means that in all you know, I've done like half a dozen prints so far. You can really set it and forget it. Like when you were talking about that being, first see layer. the first layer, yeah. The first layers never what? have not had a problem with the what, first layer. What is your bed? Ever. Is it glass or uh... it's glass with a PEI surface PEI on surface, it? Yeah. And uh, PEI is like the 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 newest hottest thing that everybody's. It's not that new, but people are using it a lot. So it's uh it's a plastic that just things stick to really really well. And you don't have to coat it or to put tape on it or anything. Um, no. t- typically, no. It should stick right on there pretty yeah. well. You do and, have to uh, worry about how much you scratch up that surface. It can bubble. Sure. Yeah, if if you because it, it heats up, right? It's heated, mm-hmm. and if you don't wait for it to cool down for scraping, you mm. can peel off the PEI from the thing it's mounted to, and you might have to replace that. Oh yikes! Okay. But you want to let the prints typically cool down anyway, because yeah. you, you'll mess up the print. But, but it's uh, not like a removable bed with flexible get the, that kind of thing. No, yeah. okay. no, this is actually a glass with uh, okay. the heating pad underneath and then the film on top. Mm-hmm. And you can get, um, like, I got a, a sheet of PEI, like maybe like a one sixteenth inch sheet that I used. I used to replace the the print surface on like my MakerBot, you yeah. know. So you can use it for other things. You can get off like McMaster Car, um, but uh, I haven't even got the. I printed out the the sample octopus on mine, uh, which is ridiculous because I got the giant the giant one to try. So we got some grand plans of things yeah. to print on that. So over the next month or so, we're gonna be putting that through its paces, and then we'll have full reviews that we'll talk about. It this is pricey. I mean, relative, yeah. like, if you're talking about a printer bot where you can buy a kit and build something that's going to be fine that you've been happy with, the has been happy but with. But pluses aren't even kits, you know. They're $1,000, and it's, like, half the price of the of the Lowell's bot, isn't it? Well, the Lowell's bot's 1250 for the mini. Oh, but, yeah, and but yeah. the, the yes. plus the, is, the like, big one, yes. is 10 by 10 by 10. Yeah. The big one's, like, 2000 yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're limited here by, you know, the, the bed size. And 6 mm-hmm. by 6 is... Sufficient for a lot of hand prop stuff, but if you're gonna make, you can't make a BBA on that. You can't make a high score on that. Yeah, yeah. With the with the Tad Six, you could print out a full helmet. Yeah, like a wearable helmet. I th- yeah, you totally <laughs> could. Like the you know like the BB eights all in panels on the yeah. the free downloads. I th- you could print out the whole head in one piece, which is something we might try. Well, I'll so, you know I, I'm still stuck in the dark ages now with my printer bot, but I will be testing the uh, printer board G two. Which I'm excited about because cool. it, it's an it currently runs an 8-bit card that does all the motor control and uh-huh. it's, it's loud as hell. <laughs> this new board is supposed to be amazingly quiet and faster. It's 32-bit. And um, is this directly from PrinterBot? Like yeah, an upgrade for exactly. Yeah. Oh, cool. So mm-hmm. it's supposed to make a big difference. I'm excited. I, the, the reason I wanted to get one of this um, for my house is I'm going to go directly from medium to medium to print. 
That's what Oculus Medium. That's I mean, doing some like kit bashing stuff, and also you got doing design for three D print though, man. It's not easy. You gotta make it everything super solid. Bring in the ZBrush. Um, I may, mean, may say. design for going up. Yes. You know, it, you, yeah. I mean, if you can afford supports, that's great. Yeah. I mean, the Cura stuff will add supports, but it's always make, also making it watertight. And Medium, mm-hmm. it's very easy to make something not watertight because you you don't know volumetrically what's on the yeah. inside. Um, but building negatives. You know, printing negative, printing That'd be molds fun. will be super fun to do. Um, yeah, so a lot, a lot of cool stuff happening. Uh, oh, and uh, the one final thing I've been testing, I got a pair for myself. Couldn't help, couldn't resist. Got a pair of AirPods. You did not. I did. You did? Yeah. Really? The, I got I got a pair for Danica for her birthday. Yeah. And then she, she, think? Was, she, she loves them, them she loves and I got them. really jealous. And so I got a pair for myself. This is, you know what this is? <laughs> this is like the freaking Star Trek episode we just watched at home, The Game. <laughs> Where everyone's playing this 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 visor game, yes. oh. and as soon as they put it on, they get addicted. I know, and it makes no <laughs> sense to anybody until they wear it. Yeah, and then you understand. Ninety-eight yeah. percent customer <laughs> approval rating. Exactly. The uh, the net net uh, what was it net score uh, recommendation score? Um, very high. Can't people people it's have crazy. it. Recommend it now. Does, I've all immediately. I don't regret. Using it and having because I've been making phone calls yeah. and, and listening to music with it. Yeah, I know I could uh, after using it for three days, uh-huh. I could see the roadmap. They're gonna be different colors. And the number one thing I wanted was I want it not in white. I think it's it's ugly. Uh-huh. I think and the, the easiest thing for them to do more colors. What about sure. a non-rigid shell? I mean, that to me is the deal breaker. The deal breaker on the shell, which is the battery pack and the holder. I mean, the actual earbud. I want a non-rigid earbud, a nice, soft, squishy thing that is comfortable to wear. Oh, oh yeah. I don't think Apple has ever done that. Yeah. On their on their earbuds. Um, on the case, there's nothing to hook this case, which is a I, get get a sticker and that says floss and put it on there. <laughs> it's just a floss carrier. Uh, but there's no ring for for a uh, wristband or for attaching it to your phone or, or purse or anything or mm. like you gotta buy the extra holster. You gotta buy a, a silicone host holster for your. Access. You're gonna buy accessory for your accessory for your accessory for your accessory. Silicone holder accessory for your charging case accessory for your earbud accessory for your phone no, no, life accessory. No, no, I, no, I, no, no. I can't follow that. Yeah, uh, but they sound good. Um, I can see the roadmap. I'm already regretting like they're gonna release some nice matte black ones later on in the year. I bet, and I'm gonna <laughs> want those. Oh boy. And they're gonna improve the the uh, the functionality by making battery life longer. And they're gonna. They're gonna do like this is a, a a like Amazon Echo. This is a Trojan horse device. This is a way to get a computer on your ear. Mm. <laughs> and how how much do they run right now? One sixty. Okay. Yeah. Why is this reasonable to people? I it's, don't understand it's this. Not. Why don't? What's wrong with the headphone jack, people? Come on, come back to the safety. This is it's a good thing. Cables. Man, I I want I want my I want my headphone cable back with it had the inline remote. <laughs> Yeah, with the screen like mini disc, I totally want that back, <laughs> dude. Track I just five. I just went on my my flight. I I have my old Cohen S nine, which actually still has buttons on it. And you know what? I love that because I can just sit there on the plane or on you know shoved on the subway, and I don't have to look at it, pull it out or anything. I can just beep 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 beep, and I can do mm-hmm. everything. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I also <laughs> switched over to Verizon. So really, I did the switch. Wow. I'm a first time Verizon customer. From what? Where'd you come from? From AT and T. I okay. got rid of the grandfathered plan. It was costing way too much. Okay. Yeah. Unlimited with tethering. So <coughs> I'll let you know how services. I can make phone calls from the office now, so that's good. <laughs> that's that, that yeah, that's kinda is, useful. That is good. Kind yeah. of useful. I've been on Project Fi, that's been good. Oh yeah. yeah. Sure. When I went to when I went to CERN, he uh he used that and it was a lifesaver. Yeah. For us. Good. I needed the Verizon for going on my trip at the end of this month mm-hmm. because Verizon is ten dollars. You get your day for your plan. Oh, cool! So unlimited data. Um, that's it for us this week. Uh, we have a bunch of cool stuff on the site. Um, we have Adam's wearing of the Alien Covenant spacesuit that Gentiates designed and Michael Mooney designed, FBFX manufactured. That is there right now. Uh, we have um, some uh, Simona. I have a video going up tomorrow. And uh, we have some other stuff. Uh, Joey's been reviewing camera lenses, and that's going to be up uh, next week before we hear the next episode of this podcast. But anything you guys want to promote or talk about, share? Hmm. Mm. 
We should have another Bits to Adam coming out soon. Yeah, is that edit coming up? Yeah. I think so. That's exciting. Yes. This is the this is the, the great uh, conclusion of the thermal detonator. Yep. That's yeah. Really cool. We're pretty excited about it. Yeah. Just tune in. All right. And uh, you can find Jeremy at Jareware on Twitter and social media. And Sean can find Sean at Count Spatula. Nope. I'm at um, Seaworth Dynamics. S- that's that's right. Yeah. Seaworth Dynamics. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's right. Good. Yeah. Seaworth Dynamics uh, on Twitter. Uh, and you guys can compete to see who has more uh, more Twitter followers. <laughs> who are you? Think, what are you, Enchan? Enchan. 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 Yeah. On, on all, the, all the things. Norm was taken? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we will see you all uh, next week on the podcast. Thank you so much, Sean, for joining us. Absolutely. Anytime. And uh, next week's our fourth, 400th episode. Whoa. Are you doing something 400th special? 400th episode. I don't know. People want it to be like a 24-hour long episode. It's not going to be an you, don't, you haven't done <laughs> that in a long no. time. Yeah, huh? there's a reason for that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we're old now. <laughs> well, yeah. You, you've now become We're old. definitely old. Some of us were already old. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, do we have an outro this week? Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Let's agree on one thing. Butt cracks are very unattractive. I saw Joey's. I did. No, I saw it. Already suppressed. (laughs) I have no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) Bye.